Hey, what's up everybody? My name is Russ with RWGResearch.com. It is currently 12, 13, 2017. And it's uh, just after 8 in the morning. Uh, this is a, another video for you guys on this series of videos. I'm really tired right now. I've been uh, really doing a lot of things. There's a lot of things happening in the background. Um, so I don't want to forget a few details. One of those is if you're not subscribed to the RWG Research Live YouTube channel, I post little snippets over there, um, little random things that only people who are closely following my work know what I'm doing. And uh, if you want to kind of get a tiny bit of insight on what's going on, you might go subscribe to that channel. I'll put the link in the description. Um, it's, uh, it's where I do my live streaming. And uh, it's also where I post little pieces of information, um, thoughts, and it's kind of like my Snapchat, if you will, where you're doing something, or Twitter, or something, where there's just little pieces of stuff there. Um, so today, I, I just, I want to talk about a lot of stuff, but I'm not quite ready to do that, as in, in my mind, I want to make sure I got it 100% proofed in my mind before I go, like, blabbing a bunch of stuff. And so... Uh, I'm quite clear in my head what I need to do, and I want to share these things with you, so I'm just sharing one little piece at a time. Um, so today's going to be real short. I hope you guys liked that last video on the capacitor. And, uh, you know, like all these principles, like I said, we're doing physics, okay? So if you can think about how you, these things work at a basic research level. Um, so I actually recently just watched a video by uh, Smarter Every Day about dominoes falling, falling, dominoes falling. And I'll link it in the description because he brings up a very valid point, which means, which is like what I've been trying to share with everybody, which is you got to go back to the very basic and do the basic research. He used a great example of like curing cancer. You can throw all the money and the best lab you ever wanted to at something such as cancer. Now, I know this will be an argumentative thing in the discussions, but just think about this. You have to do the basic research to understand how the cells work, how the cells get deformed, how things react with each other. you got to understand these basic things or you can get nowhere. That's what we're doing in these series of videos. We're going back to the basic principles. You know, look at what Heaviside did. Look at what... Uh, Maxwell did, look at what Faraday did, all of these laws were built upon these basic principles, but that doesn't mean they're 100% right. And I'm not out to break laws of physics, I'm out to understand the laws that are really happening so that we can do the kind of stuff we want to do. Because we already agreed, right, and uh, I had some things to talk about, um, I'll just bring this up first. So in, in my last video, um, a while back, you know, I was really keen on induction, right? More induction means bigger, right, magnetic field, and this magnetic field has inertia, okay? And so at some point, the math, right, from Faraday's law of induction, actually, if you just do the math, right, which is MMF, magnum motive force, which is turn times current, turns times the current. At some point, you can put so many turns and have so little current that you have an astronomical amount of inertia in that magnetic field. And you can do other things with that. It's, it's just common sense. It's like no laws of broken physics, okay? And that's the point of this. That's the point of sharing these things with you. I'm not breaking laws of physics. I'm understanding them. I'm trying to share you key values. And I'm doing it very slowly. I'm doing it very slowly because I want you guys to like, be able to think about this stuff on your own for a little while, okay? And come up with your own thoughts. Um, so, I did say that induction, right, the induced magnetic fields, the more induction, the, the, the bigger the magnetic field. Um, so if you think about it, how does that really work? Why is, that, why is that happening? And it's to my viewpoint that any two parallel wires are going to have, if one wire has 
magnetic field in it, it's going to be induced into the other magnetic field and it's going to aid in induction currents. So it's not technically the same current you're putting into it, it's actually the current being induced to the wire next to it. And if you have a coil of 250,000 turns on it and you put, you know, 100 milliamps through it, can you imagine how much induction current you put into the coil? That's why you can do turns times current. Um, so anyway, that's why that math works, okay? And like I said, I, there's so much to go into, and I just, it just can't go into all of it. Uh, so this is going to be a pretty short video. Now, 95% of what I'm telling you guys, I'm referencing from a book, and that book is in the description, and nobody ever seems to go find it, but it's there. Um, and I give credit uh, to tons and tons and tons of other people. Um, and along the way, I've had lots of my own visions, but a lot of it is written in that book. So I recommend go reading that book. Um, but if you do read that book, um, clear your mind, really clear your mind, forget everything you think you know. Okay, you cannot learn what you think you already know. And read it, understand it, get a good vision for it, because there's only a few people in this world that I know that have achieved this um, thing we're all searching for, right? A power of, a source of power that's continuous without fueling it of some kind. Um, and in this type of thinking, you know, you need a little catalyst, which is voltage, and you need to put it in there, and that catalyst is amplified and then you can get that return through the magnetic field, okay? It gets so deep. I have so much to share with you. Um, but I want to do it on the bench. I don't want to just tell you, and I'm not ready to do the bench experiments. I've done a lot of bench experiments, which is why I speak these things, actually. However, there's some things I'm waiting for to do really good bench experiments, and that's what I'm trying to get to. If that never happens, heaven forbid I said it, because I don't like speaking about things I haven't done yet. But... I have done a lot of things and that's why I speak about them. The things I'm not speaking about are the things I'm still working on on the bench and I want to prove them in a bench experiment, which is where most of this knowledge has been coming from. Okay, now that I got that little bit of stuff out of the way, I want to just talk about one thing, <clears throat> one thing today. Um, I have so much to talk about. I really want to talk about two things, but I'm not going to have the kind of time. So just real quickly, um, I, I'm going to almost read directly from the book, actually. Um, and it's the fact that the equations for work, okay, the equations for force, and the equations for power always imply, okay, they always imply a few things that don't really make a lot of sense. Now, we live on a world with gravity, so there's always a force Right, an equal and opposite force holding me onto this ground. Um, so, work, okay, is force times distance in conventional mathematics. Okay. Um, power is work divided by time in conventional mathematics. And force is mass times acceleration in conventional mathematics. So, um, if I take this brick right here, okay, this is just a cut off slab, and I hold it right here, okay, I'm just going to sit in here for a while, I'm just going to hold it, alright. Now, it's very clear that work is force times distance, so if it's not moving, if the brick doesn't move, then there's no work being done because there's a force pulling it down that's gravity right but it's not moving so is there any work being done is there any work being done right now conventional mathematics says no okay now the question to you is do you think i'm getting tired I am exerting work. I am working to hold this against the force that it's being being applied to it via gravity. Okay? But conventional mathematics says 
that there's no work being done right now, but I can guarantee you I'm getting very tired. So I am working unobviously. I am the unobvious work here, okay? The same thing with power. Work divided by time. Okay, if there's no work, well, then there's no power. And conventional mathematics says there's no work, but trust me, I'm getting very tired right now. And force, right, is mass times acceleration. Well, there is a force, there is a mass, but there's no acceleration. That's, I picked a heavy brick, okay? That's not easy to straight-armed like that. So what I'm trying to point out here is that if I took a fridge magnet, I'm not going to draw this up here, if I took a fridge magnet and stuck it on the refrigerator, there is a force pulling it to gravity, but it is holding itself up there. So there is an unobvious force, okay? So when you start thinking about it, all right, if I had, right, a cliff, and I had a rock sitting on the edge of this cliff, one would tell you what? One would say, well, that rock has potential energy because it can fall it can fall, oh man, I can't erase this one oh, that's inches, a hundred feet, okay? down to the ground so conventionally they would say, well, this rock has potential energy. Okay. So, let's get rid of the potential energy. Okay. Now, I have the rock down here, and it's no longer up here. One would say, well, now your potential energy has been used. It went from potential to kinetic to potential. Well, technically, since it's at the bottom and has nowhere else to go, then the potential energy is now gone. But what I'm telling you right now is there's no such thing as potential energy. Everything is kinetic. Everything on this planet is kinetic energy. Okay? There's no such thing as absolute zero. Or if there is, we can't do it here. Maybe out in space somewhere there really truly is. But the point is, is everything's always moving. Everything's always expanding, they say, in the universe, whatever. But the, what I'm trying to just point out is that, actually, if you were to look at this rock, okay, if you were to look at this rock, you, you'd notice that it's composed, okay, of individual, right, atoms. These atoms and their makeup, if you want to call them electrons, and it just, you know, we're not going to go so deep here. We're looking at it from abroad. But the point is, is this, what's happening here is constantly moving. Which means the rock had kinetic energy as it sat here. And it still has the same kinetic energy down here. Now, the rock as a whole created this difference here. But what I'm trying to point out is everything always has kinetic energy. There really isn't anything such as potential energy. And that's a, that's a hard one to wrap your head around, actually. But the point is, is that this is unobvious, okay? You can't really see what's actually going on there, okay? And this is important because at the same time, all right, at the same time, a magnetic field, right, they say a magnetic field is just a stagnant thing that just sits there and, 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 and it cannot do any work. But it can. It's actually something that can absolutely do work. And I don't want to speak outside my, ba my boundaries. i got a lot of thoughts to say, but I'm just trying to scratch the surface here. Just to kind of just get you thinking about how this is really working. Okay, because there is unobvious work, unobvious power, and unobvious force. And then there is obvious work, obvious power, and obvious force. When you understand that everything is in kinetic motion, including a magnetic field, okay, and the spin, all right, everything like this is all 100% in kinetic motion at all times, then you realize that you can use that magnetic field to do work. 
okay? And in, in, a, in, in a magnetic field such as a ginormous inductor, you know, huge coil, right? 250,000 turns of number 30, 50,000 ohms, okay? About 12 foot tall, about 11 and a half inches round, with a four and a half inch core in the middle. Sometime, you will be seeing such a device, and we will be testing it. Like I said, I want to bench test these things. Um, and I will be bench testing these things, because I know they work. I already have it here. I've already seen it through other people. I'm using their bench experiments to teach you this stuff right now before I can do it myself and really show you clearly. So I'm trying to give you guys the basic fundamental thinking here. Okay. Um, so there, there, there really is like a lot to talk about. Um, another example. Okay, this is a good example. Um, if I had a, uh, if I had a wall, right, and uh, I attached a horseshoe magnet on there, right, and I had a, a metal plate. And I had a guy holding this plate. Then this plate is going to want to be attracted to this magnet. Right? And technically, this will be pulling on it. Right? So this is the equal and opposite reaction. So this is the same principle of a, a fridge magnet. You know, you can sit there and you can hold that magnet. That plate, I mean. And it's going to be pulling against that magnet. You can set this up with... I, sh I should have done that, but you can set this up with the... You know, a magnet, two magnets, and two strings, you know. Technically, the force is down towards gravity, yet they're being pulled together this way. So that's absolutely something that's doing unobvious work. I mean, it just, it just, it doesn't break any laws. We're just thinking about things in a way that makes more sense. Because I can guarantee you that if I hold this brick, and I ask the question, is this brick doing work to a, high-level person with real great knowledge most likely they'll tell me no because it's not moving so it's not doing work if it's not doing work it's not doing power okay and power right is how fast and how much you do something so the more the faster the more power it may take less time but the more power so there is one other thing I'll bring up real quick. What time is it? I'm just gonna scratch this because I really, yeah, you know, I can't erase this because it's wet erase. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out one last thought, which is what I told you guys last time. You don't need current to produce a magnetic field. You just need alignment. Now we're not gonna get so deep into the physics, you know, proton alignment, electron alignment, atom alignment. What's really going? We're looking at it from a global perspective here. But I'm going to throw you an idea, right? A magnetic field is interacting with a wire without touching it. A magnet is interacting with another magnet through its field without touching it. How can that be? How can there be physically something that's interacting with something else without it physically interacting? Do you understand what I'm saying? So how can, how can a magnet interact with a wire when you pass that past the, the wire? How can it interact with it if it's not physically touching it? Because science says, you know, well, like for instance, in bill, billiard balls, right, playing pool, one ball hits another. You transfer that energy from one to another. But in this case, it'd be like, oh, we're going to put an imaginary something in there, and we're going to say, before it ever touches it, it's going to transfer the energy to the other one. It, it just kind of doesn't even make sense when you think about it that way. So, um, what I'm trying to get at is these, I'm going to draw it very crude. This is a, this is a magnet. And this magnet only has eight atoms that we're going to align the spins on to create the magnetic field. Okay, we're going to align the atoms so that we can see the external magnetic field. 
So if we take the same exact thing, and these uh, these are like random. Uh, um, okay. Then there's no alignment here. There's no magnetic field, but it has potential. Potential, not potential energy. It has potential to create a magnetic field. Okay, so all we gotta do is align it. So we do that with an external electrical magnetic field usually um, for a permanent. Oops, for a permanent magnet. But here's the crazy thing: <laughs> if the fields are interacting, then they're physically interacting with the particles. Okay, so what's actually happening here is, in this case, there would physically only be two flux lines because there's only two rows of atoms. Every single line of flux and or shell of flux, because it, it does kind of go all the way around. It gets confusing in 3D. We'll just look at it in 2D right now. But the point is, is that yes, these alignments of atoms actually physically make a shell, a force. And you can't actually like cut that force, you know, that line of force, unless you use something like a wire. But if you were using two magnets, you physically cannot get the fields to pass each other. So I'll draw it up here. So if I had um, if I had a magnet like this, and I placed another one right here, okay, and I can't erase this, but what would happen is this field would be deflected against that one. And the closer you get these, that's what, how the repelling forces work. These are physical interactions in space real interactions. The re field is real. It's a real thing. It's not some imaginary thing. The flux field. And so here these get compressed. Now if you had a wire, you can actually cut the lines of flux. And they do teach you this actually. They say, you know, a magnet passing a wire cuts the lines of flux. And the more flux lines it cuts, the more current it, it induces. Well, okay. So they know these things, but they don't speak of them the same way that I'm teaching you. But what's important here is if you can imagine that that this okay each one of these atoms is attached to this field in some configuration. This is kind of going back to what is a field question. But these atoms are physically attached through spring-like mechanisms right like a fluid uh like a not well kind of like a non-compressible fluid almost if you wanted to think of it that way um but we'll leave that out right now but what i'm just trying to show you is actually these atoms are physically bound to the flux field and so when you add a magnet over here right and you have the same thing right these are actually physically interacting through face, through through space, physically interacting through space. So this magnet right here and this magnet right here is physically interacting with each other because these, you could call them electrons if you want, but some people just absolutely despise that. But whatever you want to imagine them being, okay, I don't care. But what I'm trying to say is these things out here, they have spin. We can, let's just talk about electrons because most people know that. So these have spin and that you push, you align and then you push the spins out. That's what the field is. These are moving magnetic fields like a, like a river of kinetic energy. Okay, and they're moving and they're interacting with each other. Okay, and then these individual pieces, atoms, electrons, whatever, um, we'll call them electrons, are attached to the particle in the material. So it's always there, right? In this one with no magnetic field externally, the same energy is in there, the same energy, okay? The same kinetic energy. But you just can't see it, you can't access it, you can't interact with it, you can't do anything because it's in the material. This is the same thing with a wire, with a copper wire. If you put current through a copper wire, you align all the atoms. You, all you need to do is align them. After that, you can do some crazy stuff with it. And you don't need any extra current, because as soon as you start heating the wire, 
you end up shooting yourself in the foot and you're fighting yourself, right? This is where, I won't speak any further because I don't want to speak out, but um, I don't want to say any wrong things here, but in my head I see, I completely understand what I'm trying to express to you. Um, so here, these magnetic fields are actually internal. They're interacting with each other inside because they're not all aligned. They're, they're localized for each one of these individuals. That's why when you align it all as a global source, you actually get a global, right? It's the idea of, uh, of concentrating, oh, what do they call it? Um, oh, I forgot now. I can't think of the name. But it's whenever you take atoms and you, uh, you put them all in the same, the same motion. So, for instance, when you cool something like a superconductor, right everything is coherently working together like coherent is the word i think so you have coherence between all these all these uh, atoms and you can do that at room temperature with a regular piece of let's say neodymium right you can you can permanently align everything through an external force right so this external force is a one time force it may be a couple thousand maybe 20,000 joules of energy or something insane Right, it's actually more probably like, actually do it, magnetize a permanent magnet of this size, let's say it's an inch by, and two, let's say it's a two by one inch magnet, it would probably actually physically take in a pulse magnetizer, because I have access to one, um, less than 10,000 joules. So you apply less than 10,000 joules, okay, to this to, to create the alignment, once the alignment is done, they can coherently work together to push what's happening internally out to the outside so you can physically access it. Now ask yourself, if it took 10,000 joules to make this magnet align all the atoms, get this magnetic field out here in space where you can interact with the actual atoms on the inside from these bound particles, okay, through these spring-like mechanisms, right, and thanks for a few people on my forums who gave me some of these visions, I really appreciate that, I won't call names, you know who you are, um, but I've been thinking similar lines, and then all of it just started making more sense. And then when you look at it like this, you realize that if it took 10,000 joules to make this magnet, and this magnet can be passed by a wire over and over and over and over and over, ask yourself, at which point do you get more than 10,000 joules out of the interaction between this field and the copper wire and the current going out of it? Right? I'm not talking about how much power it takes to spin the magnet past stuff. We'll get into that another day. Because if you pass a magnet, pass a coil at 90 degree angles, you can basically eliminate Lin's law. You don't need to worry about that uh, cogging effect. And at that point, you question yourself, well, how many times can I pass a magnet past a wire without the cogging or Lin's law effect to create 10,000 joules, which is what it took to actually permanently magnetize this magnet. And at that point, you realize, oh, actually, in this circumstance, technically, you could get more than 10,000 joules out of this field. Why? Because this field used to be internal and you couldn't access it. And now it's external and you can use it to do work. But the field is an unobvious thing, right? But it's physical, realistic, and it does actually happen. Right? When they model things, they actually literally give you the fact that there's a field and that it squashes and that it's compressible with two magnets. And, like, it's a real physical thing. So, okay, I told you this was going to be a short video, and I absolutely have to get going now or I'm going to be late. So, God bless you guys. Thank you for your prayers in the last video. That one fire, uh, for sure, that's really about you know, 50 or less miles away from here apparently is still burning completely out of control and it's extremely windy over there still. Um, it stopped being so windy here so there's no ash coming this way but it is absolutely terrifying. Um, so just give give some more love and prayers out to those people and, and, any, and anybody in need right now. Um, so yeah that's all I got for you. God bless you guys. Thank you for your support. Um, and I just, I just want to uh, be, be humble in my, my sharing of this knowledge because um, if you've ever heard of the word tithing, right, where you're supposed to give 10% of your money back, you don't have to give it to a church. You can give it to whoever you want. But give back what you've been given is the principle taught there. And I can replace the word money with knowledge. 
Okay? So if knowledge is given to me, I will give it away. And instead of giving 10%, I will give 110%. And I'll try to do it as clear as possible. Try to make it as clear as possible. Some of the thoughts today, and I most likely over the next couple of weeks may not make any more videos until I get things I'm doing settled. There's some big things I'm doing. I need to get everything settled. Um, and then I actually want to do the bench experiment right with that. So anyway, so the knowledge, okay, the knowledge is given and it, and it, and it will be given back, right? If you ask, you shall receive. And when you receive, that is something that you've been given. And if you've been given it, you should be giving it back. Don't be so greedy about knowledge. It's ridiculous. Knowledge should be freely shared if it's freely given. Okay? I know some people will say, Well, I worked really hard for a really long time. Well, maybe you should have just asked for questions and stuck to a little more prayer, in my opinion, and maybe you wouldn't have had to work quite as hard. I work hard, if you guys don't realize that. Um, but I also feel 100% that this stuff should be, should be given back. And what, what is the key point when you give, be it money, be it your time, uh, be it um, knowledge? What's the key point there, right? You're, you're trusted with a certain amount of information, money, or time in some circumstances. If you use it wisely and you do good with it, then you'll be given more. So when you give, you'll be given more if you do good things with it. So if you're greedy about your money and you want to just hang on to it for yourself and then you know it does no good because eventually you're going to die and that whatever you did with that money if you bought a boat or a car or something it's just going to it's materialistic stuff it, it means nothing at the end of the day um, I'm not saying those things aren't wonderful I'm just trying to express how important it is to to give back what you've been freely given okay you can still have your boat <laughs> right just give people rides or something I don't know um, but I'm just saying, I'm pointing that out because it's important, because I clearly see that when you give freely and you do the right things with the things you've been given, you'll be given more, and you'll be given more. And some people keep asking me, like, how some of these things in my life, how, how did I achieve some of these things in my life? A lot of you may not know my backstory, and I'm not going to tell it here now. <clears throat> but there's been a wonderful things happened to me in my life, and I can't explain half of them, except for the fact that my faith has gotten me here. And through my faith, through the Bible, right, um, through that thinking, through that mentality of life, it has gotten me things that I could never, ever, ever achieve on my own, ever, period. Because I know that this is a global thing. This is for all of us. And, uh, and, and I, just, I just keep, I, I keep, I've been given more than I could ever do on my own. Okay, through this principle of giving my knowledge, my time, and my effort. <clears throat> I don't really care about money at all. Money means nothing uh, to me, honestly. But I have to have money to live in this world because this world is corrupt. <laughs> and that's the way the world works. So right now you have to deal with that. But even with your money, if you give it, you'll be given more if you do it right. And these principles are all taught in the Bible. This is why I share these things with you. You don't have to be religious to believe and work in that mentality of thinking, okay, of what's in the Bible, all right? God bless you guys. Have a good day. Hope you learned something. Bye-bye.